I have Dorothy Calamaris on the call right now. Thank you for joining us. We're mm -hmm. in our rooms. Thank you. Yeah, we're in our rooms right now, again, because we're still trying to stay indoors. We're trying to stay at home because we're dealing with this COVID-19 crisis right now. Such a weird situation. How are you doing? I'm doing great, considering. Consider. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you for jumping on this call. Dorothy uh, is an author. She's a chef. She's a wellness coach. You've written three books. Is that right? Actually, five books. Five books? Mm -hmm. uh, the one on Amazon that I was looking at was, was the Anti-Inflammatory Diet and Action Plan. I believe that was the first one I wrote. I think that was 2015 because I have a second one. That's this one. And that one I wrote in 2017. And then I had one that came out that's um, uh, anti-inflammatory, one pot easy that came out this past October. And then I have a Mediterranean diet and lifestyle book. And then I have a little self-published, which is probably the, the most useful place for people to start. It's just an anti-inflammatory diet for one. And it's uh, five days worth of menus, uh, recipes rather, and, uh, you know, with a shopping list and a five-day menu planner. So that's usually where I send people when they are, want to just poke their toe in it, um, you know, because it's only a five-day commitment. That's good. There's a lot of information that looked like a big book. Yeah. It's a little intimidating to go through all that. And I know everybody's got different interests and, and not everybody is wanting to go head first into an anti-inflammatory book, but it's really important. And that's part mm -hmm. of why I wanted to bring you on today is because uh, that's something that I really care about is inflammation because I have, as a physical therapist, I have a lot of my clients that do ask me about inflammation and I run these different Facebook support groups and a lot of people have questions about what they can do to reduce inflammation. And so, and, and many times the only other alternative that they have is to get prescription medication like ibuprofen, diclofenac, or other medications that often have these harmful side effects. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to bring, in, bring on somebody like yourself who has written these books and has some good experience um, and has probably looked at some of the research, but you're also even a chef and you run a great website with a lot of blogs and recipes. Great, thank you. Yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. So did you always know that this was a good diet? Uh, what brought you into really learning more about an anti-inflammatory diet? I am really fortunate in that I came from a very large Greek family in California that has a farm in Manteca. So I grew up eating primarily just whole real foods. You know, I didn't know that that was unusual because <laughs> it was just the way we ate. Um, and it wasn't until actually I became an adult when people were talking about cooking from scratch that I heard that phrase. Because again, we just cooked, you know, we didn't know there was like, you buy frozen food or you cook from scratch. We didn't know that. So, um, so I have that background, which is great, you know, so I, I didn't have to be, I didn't have to personally go through the process of getting rid of junk and eating real food. Um, but my husband was diagnosed when we were in our thirties, he passed away uh, in 2017 he was diagnosed with diabetes and that's when it really hit home for me because I could not get him to eat what I was cooking. He just wouldn't do it. And it was very, very frustrating because I would say to him, we're the same age. We are just a year apart and I have no health conditions and you have a ton, you know, so why can't you make the connection? It's between, you know, I'm not an athlete, but you move every day and you eat whole real foods every day. And odds are you'll keep yourself healthy. And, you know, in that span from almost 40 to 62, he went through the whole series with diabetes and passed away. So you can't underestimate the value of eating a whole real foods diet. And then within that context, as we talk, we can drill down a little bit, you know, to be more specific to injury. But if you remember nothing else, just remember to eat whole real foods, unprocessed foods. Yeah, well, sorry to hear, hear that about your husband. I know a lot of people are dealing with something similar to that. And it's when you're trying to eat healthy and you're trying to you know, cut out sugars or cut out, cut out complex carbs, depending on what you need to cut out. Yeah. Uh, for, so some, for something like diabetes or other conditions, then it's, it's really hard to do. It's, it's hard to put that into practice. Um, and so... When you're, when you're talking about real whole foods, what are, you, what are you referring to exactly if someone doesn't really know exactly what that is? Sure. So again, this is like first step. Um, so first step is because 
I understand if you're, you know, like my husband would, you know, eat KFC over anything else, right? So if you're used to those processed food, which are usually fast foods, pretty much anything in a package, um, you know, is a processed food, um, your body starts to crave the fat and salts and sugars in those foods. And that's no accident. The food companies design those foods to make you want them. The reason why we have um, 15 different varieties of apples is, again, food manufacturers are like, well, people only buy a Granny Smith apple for so long. How do we get them to buy more apples, right? So they do that with produce, but they're also doing that with all the packaged products on the shelves. So it's very hard to break that addiction. So the first step is I usually tell people if they could start off with 50% of their plate being fruits and vegetables. Um, I often, when I'm working with, with clients, that's a good way to begin. So if you just start with 50% of every meal being fruits or vegetables, um, you know, then over time, as you sort of get used to the flavors of fruits and vegetables, then you might be able to take the next steps where you're dropping how much meat you eat and, you know, you're eating high quality fats. But so again, when I say whole real foods, I mean, anything that comes out of the ground, um, so that includes, you know, vegetables, fruits, uh, grains, whole grains, not processed grains. But again, like I said, there's going to be some modifications as we talk it through a little bit. High quality fats, um, which I could probably do a whole show just on that. Um, and um, simple cooking techniques, you know, it doesn't really have to be complicated. Um, one woman I worked with, she would just take two cups of salad greens and put it on the bottom of lunch and dinner, you know, so whatever else she was eating, she would just dump it on top of two cups of salad greens. And that's perfectly fine. That's one way to start getting that in your body. That's great. And those leafy greens and, the, and those vegetables, they have the, the micronutrients that you need. Yeah. I remember, right. you know, when I, like, I was really big into playing baseball in high school, and it was all, always about gaining weight, gaining muscle. And so it was more about the macros. I wasn't even thinking about the, the micronutrients. I was just thinking about if I'm getting enough protein mm-hmm. and getting enough and just monitoring the ratio of protein carbs and fats but it's really about the the quality and density of the nutrients that you're actually getting as well we tend to be a macro oriented culture you know we we really do focus on carbs and proteins and fats and uh, sort of forget like you say the micronutrients i mean now that everybody is looking more at plant-based eating and realizing not only is it good for us but it's good for the environment but honestly that's kind of recent i mean it's probably within the last 20, 15 years that people have really started focusing in that direction. And going back to your book, you have a book called The Anti-Inflammatory Diet. So Mm -hmm. what exactly, what exactly is an anti-inflammatory diet? So inflammation in your body can manifest in a lot of different ways. And primarily when we're talking about an anti-inflammatory diet, we're looking at the foods that you have a sensitivity to. And this is very key. I don't want people to think they have allergies. Food allergies are very specific and very dramatic in the body and can involve an EpiPen and hospital visits. Um, They are relatively rare, but a lot of us have food sensitivities and a lot of us don't even know what those sensitivities are until you try an elimination diet. And the most common things that people are sensitive to tend to be dairy, soy, peanuts, fish, shellfish, wheat, or gluten. Um, I feel like I'm missing a couple here eggs, shellfish. Um, So when you eat foods that you have a sensitivity to, your body, it it suppresses your immune system. Your body can't really get the full nutrients out of it. It can't really digest it properly. It's trying to figure out what the heck to do with it. And so in that process, you sort of build up inflammation. It releases histamines, again, because it's, it's not feeling right. You know, it can't quite process it. So it's trying to figure it out. And so it starts, it starts to attack it because it doesn't understand what it's doing there. And that releases histamines into the body, which then creates inflammation. I mean, inflammation is what our body does to heal. You know, it creates pain in an area so that we know we've burned ourselves or injured ourselves. It's, it's a way to communicate that there's a problem. So the only way to really find out what is truly an anti-inflammatory diet for you is you eliminate the known uh, sensitivities, the most common sensitivities, for a period of six or eight weeks. And then gradually you bring one item in at a time and you try it for, I've, it varies. Some people say as little as three days. Some people say for five days. 
and you really pay attention to how your body reacts to those things. And then the other thing that can be very difficult for some people are nightshades. And nightshades include tomatoes and eggplant, peppers, um, and those are uh, potatoes, white potatoes, not, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yams and sweet potatoes. Um, those are another thing your body might have proce uh, trouble processing. So it could be a broad range of things, or you could find out that it's maybe just one or two things. And then after you've been on an elimination diet for a period of time and you've determined what it, are the things that cause sensitivities or reactions in your bodies, but if you can't live without those things, sometimes if you stay away with, from them for a long time, you can maybe have a little bit of dairy and it's okay. Um, for some people, it's a game changer. You know, once they stop it, they can never have it again. I'm not saying stopping it is what makes you never have it again. But once you become clear on how that impacts your body, then you're like, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. Exactly. I've been clear that lactose and, and eating dairy products has been impactful on my body. I've, I've had uh, adverse reactions to drink, you know, drinking milk and, and eating cheese or having ice cream since I was probably 12 years old. And so I've always stayed away from that. I've taken lactose pills. But it, it was interesting. About two years ago, I went on a keto diet for about uh -huh. a month and a half. And the one thing I noticed about that, although I, I, I didn't feel like I could sustain it, but the one thing that was that jumped out to me the most was that I can eat dairy. Uh -huh. he, put some, he put a low dairy cheese and uh, had a nutritionist help me. And he ended up putting a, a low um, a lactose cheese that was, that was in, in my meal plan. And I felt okay with it. And then I started to eat other cheese. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so great. And then I started eating more. And I had no adverse reaction to it. But as soon as I got off keto, or if I had a, like a pizza, for example, that had carbs with yeah. the cheese, then I went just terrible. I had a terrible reaction to it. So... Right. I mean, there, there's also non-dairy milks, and I, I, not, I don't mean the nut, hemp, and all of those milks. There's, you know, goat and sheep. So a lot of times when people have sensitivities with cow's milk, they may not have sensitivities with goat or sheep's milk. And then you mentioned cheese. You know, there's enzymes in those cheeses, and cheese often is more digestible for people, let's say, than a glass of milk. And then lastly, you brought up something key, eating pizza. Pizza can be a sensitivity palooza, you know? I mean, it's typically like a wheat crust, so you got gluten, typically tomato sauce, so you have a nightshade, and then you've got cheese on top. So even though you might be able to eat tomatoes, or you might be able to eat nan bread or something, and you might be able to eat cheese, you put that all together, and that could just overload your system, and then you have a sensitivity reaction to it. Oh, that's sad news, Dorothy. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm like, sorry. <laughs> yes. So um, this, so anti-inflammatory diet, what, when, when you're eating an anti-inflammatory diet, is it benefiting you because it's not causing inflammation or is it actually reducing inflammation? Both. I mean, both. It's, it's not, a, you know, it's not building any inflammation because as long as you continue to eat those things that your body reacts negatively to, you're going to constantly be feeding that inflammation in the body. And then the other thing it does is it starts to tamper down, reduce the inflammation in your body and, you know, allows your body to then absorb the nutrients it needs and, and put its energy towards the main source of inflammation, whether it's a shoulder or knee, a hip, whatever, you know, it, it aids healing by taking the stress off of the digestion pro digestive process. And, and there's been more... Uh, headlines in the news about gut inflammation or, or even digestive inflammation as well. And so my, just my understanding of it is if you have inflammation in, in your intestines and in your digestive tract, that influences your ability to process nutrients as well. And that could lead to poorer health outcomes, sure. uh, delayed recovery from injuries. So is that, is that true? I mean, is the digestive no, system affected by this? For sure. All true. And it interferes with your sleep too. You know, if you're uncomfortable um, because you're digesting, you're not sleeping well, which is, again, another big component of healing, you know. So, I mean, it really is a, a huge ripple effect in every, in every aspect of, you know, of your life. Have you had any experience as far as, like, seeing how it's helped with, it, with any injuries or pain? I think yeah. the pain component is the biggest thing. Uh, I see I help a lot of people that have lower back pain or they're dealing with sciatic nerve pain. They'll, they'll get a pain that shoots down their leg and meniscus tear injuries. And so it, 
when somebody's trying to recover as a physical therapist, we're helping them with the movement components. We're helping them with proper load management, which could almost be equivalent to like the macronutrients, making mm-hmm. sure we're getting the right dosage of food or dosage of exercise and movement. Then you can get into more details where it's the, you, you start to control the exercise parameters like the reps and sets or form. Mm-hmm. And then that might be like tweaking the types of mm-hmm. foods that you eat. So, No, that's exactly right. That's the same pattern you would want for both. You know, most of the people that I work with are people that are experiencing arthritis for the first time or, you know, they're they, it, typically it's not an injury. It's more like an age related um, breakdown. But what is interesting is how pleasantly surprised they are. And also for some reason, I, I get a charge out of it too, even though I know it's going to happen at how much better they feel like they're able to off the, you know, the Advil you know, three or four times a day, you know, they're, uh, they're not, honestly, I mean, I know this is, isn't what I'm trying to be a proponent of, but they start drinking less because part of why they're, and I mean, alcoholic drinks and, you know, part of why they're drinking is they have this chronic pain, you know, so that as the, the pain subsides, all those other things that you do, because you're, again, you're a little irritated, you're a little cranky, you know, cause you're not feeling right. You know, those things start to lift. And, and the other thing, to remember is I know it sounds hard when you're first presented with it, but the more that you start to eat in a way that your body can work with, the less you want that other stuff. You know, you naturally, I mean, it's going to take time. It's not overnight, but you naturally start wanting more and more of what works for your body and less and less of what doesn't work for your body. And I've been working with this one client now, um, it's a year in, and we did, you know, 90 days and then he took some time off and came back to me and, um, you know, he's still tweaking, you know, he's still working on, you know, I, now I want to change this. Like now we were focusing on nightshades, whereas before we were focusing on dairy and, and gluten, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a process. It's a long process. It's like, well, if I drop this off, will I feel even better? So it's, again, it's very much like what you're doing and, and it is, and it has to be in concert too. I mean, you can't just do food and you can't just do movement. You know, you really want to do it in concert and work holistically with the body. Absolutely. And that's, that's my whole point is that if you start the, the most ideal exercise program or rehab program and your diet stays the same, or if you just get poor sleep, you're not getting good sleep, you're not getting nutrients to promote healing, then your expectations, you know, if if someone's expecting to to get completely out of pain, then they're going to have a tough time. And that may not be a reasonable expectation if they're not changing anything else. So there really, there is a way out of pain. There is this, there's an opportunity to change because if you combine all these different evidence-based interventions, then it can, you know, cumulatively have this effect on helping somebody get out of this chronic persistent injury or pain that they've had. Yeah. And then also related to that, like you said, not getting enough sleep. If you're not eating right, you might have heartburn and acid reflux and heartburn and acid reflux will impact your ability to do the exercises or movements that will help you heal. You know, especially acid reflux. If you're somebody who can't lay flat on the ground, you know, to do leg lifts or whatever needs to be done, you know, then you're going to avoid those recipes, those recipes, those exercises. (laughs) And you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be able to do them to their full effect. So, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it'll impact that too. It'll impact how effective your workout is if you are battling intestinal distress while you're working out. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So what kind of foods should we be avoiding? What are some of the high anti-inflammatory foods? Well, uh, anything, again, pretty much anything that comes in a prep package, processed, you know, like regular white breads. I would say even I wouldn't buy whole wheat bread. I mean, if you... If you need toast, um, you could use, um, um, it's called manna from heaven. It's a bread that's just really soaked grains. It's sort of pressed together. And then there's a variety of gluten-free breads out there. But again, gluten-free doesn't necessarily mean it's a healthy bread. There's gluten-free breads out there that are made that are highly processed and don't have any fruit in them. And then there are gluten-free breads, which I would suggest that are uh, wild yeast breads that are made of whole grains because those wild wild yeast is also good for your microbiomes and your digestion. Um, processed meats, you don't want to eat processed meats. You don't want to eat um, baked goods. Um, you really want to limit sugar. Sugar is one that is very deceptively damaging. 
Um, you know, you, uh, let's see, what else do we want to avoid? It, ideally, you want to eat organic. Um, ideally, you want to eat pastured and free-ranged meat, uh, wild-caught fish, because anything that has been factory farm-raised is, take a cow, for instance, cows are not supposed to eat corn. A lot of people actually react to corn. Corn is something that people have sensitivities to. So if you're eating an animal that's been fed nothing but corn its whole life, then you're going to be eating essentially corn. But not only that, is that that animal isn't as nutrition, nutritious as it can be because it's not living or eating the way it was designed to. So if you're eating grass-fed or pastured meats, you know, then you're getting the full benefit of that food. I know those things are very expensive. So what I tell people um, when I teach is make a decision about what you can afford. And, you know, what, what, whatever works within your budget, if you have the budget for pastured, grass-fed, great. If you don't, you know, so then maybe you buy just one steak and you combine it with a lot of vegetables and a stir fry or, you know, somehow extend it with fried rice or whatever, you know, so that um, you're not, yeah, you're not sitting down eating steak and potatoes because you can't really afford that, but you're still getting better quality within your budget. What about uh, organic brown rice versus white rice? What about the... You know, I mean, organic brown rice versus organic white organic rice? Organic white, white rice. Yeah. Let's, let's, you know let's, what? Let's either, do. you know what? The, the, the difference is so negotiable that, you know, and I mean, I kind of feel like so many cultures have eaten white rice for so long and it's been such a mainstay and hasn't really seemed to be an issue. And for most people, if their stomach's upset, one of the soothing things to do is eat rice. So I feel like the, the difference in fiber is not significant. Um, for me, because I have a chef's mindset, it's about what works best in the dish. And so, you know, certain things like brown rice, steamed brown rice, let's say with walnuts, you know, and, and greens and, you know, walnut oil or whatever, I would want brown rice in that dish. But if I'm doing something that is, um, you know, soy sauce, Asian, whatever, then I want white rice for that dish. You know, so it just kind of, for me, kind of depends on what I think is more complementary to the other ingredients in the dish. That's good. And uh, when you're going through a crisis and maybe you don't have a lot of money to spend on food, then yeah. using rice, like you said, you can, you can have a dish where you have some organic protein or some grass-fed grass -fed beef or um, eggs. eggs. And just if you're not, if you don't, have, some rice. If you don't yeah, have yeah. some rice with it. If you don't react to eggs, a lot of people do, but yeah. What are some other uh, action steps that somebody can take? So if somebody is just, somebody is wanting to like look into reducing inflammation in their diet for, for, to see if it affects their pain or to see mm -hmm. if it can, it can make them feel better and not feel so sluggish, what can they really start to do now to begin that journey? I would say the first thing to do is replace anything that you get in a package with something that isn't in a package um, for as much as you can. Um, now, I also understand in the times we're in right now, it's very difficult and, you know, you can't just go to the store like we used to and, you know, people are trying to use up what's in the house and, and all of that. But um, and under normal circumstances, like, in fact, one of the best first things to do that is very inspirational, if you can, is go to a farmer's market around you because pretty much everything in a farmer's market, almost everything, I mean, there's going to be some vendors there selling some packaged things, which will have some processing to them but pretty much everything there is okay. Um, I mean, there'll be baked goods there too, but you know, but if you, when you see the seasonal fruits and vegetables, um, it's very inspirational. I mean, it really kind of excites you to get home and start trying some stuff and, you know, making some things. So that's, that's one fun way to kind of get going on it. Um, and then, like I said, the other thing that works well is to start with the half the plate being fruits and vegetables. And then the second half of the plate being, you know, good quality protein um, and fats, or if you're vegetarian, instead of the protein, you might want to have, you know, whole grains. Um, whole grains, again, can be an issue. Um, I just know for myself, like farro, even though it's got gluten in it, doesn't bug me, but kamut also has gluten in it, does. Wheat does, you know, so whole grains can be tricky for, for people. Um, I think probably initially, if you're in pain, it's good to avoid grains and gluten entirely for a while and just see if that makes a difference. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot of just 
experimenting with different foods and being smart about it, but then going through each, each type of food and seeing how you react. The other day I had, I had a meal and I just felt just itchy afterwards. Uh. And I just was like, I don't know if it was because of, I don't think it was stress. I, I think I was an even level of stress, my baseline. And uh, I, I just didn't, I just felt like I was just like itchy almost. I was like, I don't know why I just feel fidgety in my chair working. So there must have been some reaction to that. Yeah. And you really, you know, the thing is to pay attention without judgment too, because um, there's so much information out there. And so like, again, I had a client come to me and it, it cracked me up and he said, I want to be vegan. And I said, okay. I said, so what would being vegan do for you? And he said, well, I just think I'm supposed to be vegan. <laughs> and I said, that's not a good enough reason. <laughs> you know, I said, you're not going to maintain it if it's something you think you're supposed to do. You know, so it's also releasing that judgment of, you know, oh, I should be keto or I should be paleo or, you know what I mean? It's like, listen to your individual body and see how your body reacts. Not everybody can be vegan or vegetarian or not everybody can be paleo or keto. Like you said, you did keto for a while, but you realized you couldn't sustain it, you know? So you just really have to listen to your body reactions and, and then, you know, let your body guide you because it will if you give it a chance. Yeah, it's fascinating information. I, and I love this topic, again, because there's so many people that are dealing with inflammation and they do, they know that it does play a role and they're looking to reduce it. And everybody just, they, they want to take a, like a pain medication or they want to take something to get rid of it. And so I've always been a proponent of eating whole real foods. And it's just that people need to put it into action. They need to put it into their, um, you know, into their lifestyle and make that change. And then, and then the whole goal is to be able to conservatively manage these injuries and, and for people to get out of pain, um, at least, you know, with what, what I'm helping people with primarily. And I'm trying to get people off of the pharmaceutical drugs. I'm trying to get yeah. them off of ibuprofen. Right. That's why I've been, I've been a huge proponent of curcumin extract, of turmeric extract, because of, of the high dose that you can take. If there's a, there are quite a few studies that say if you take 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams a day, it, it can help to reduce inflammation. It has this modulatory effect on cytokines and some of the chemicals that do cause pain. And so, but that, again, that, those are like the additional things that you add on to, to your diet. Like if you're, if you're just eating pizza yeah. and then you're going to take some curcumin, it's just yeah. like, you got, you have to do both. You, you, you have to start with one and go to the other. You got to start with the basics. So yeah, again, we're not either. Uh, we're, we come from a culture where that's not, um, you know, as soon as I hit 40, my doctor started wanting to put me on drugs, you know, the usual, right? Blood pressure lowering, cholesterol lowering. And I told her, I said, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do it, you know? And, and uh, all these years later, and we almost every year, she's like, you know, she wants to get me on these drugs. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. And I, I have said, if, until you can prove to me that I have occlusion or I have issues, I'm not going to consider it. You know, so again, we have a culture that, and I'm, I'm, this is just for me, I'm not, saying this is how people should be in the world. But I'm just saying we come from a culture where it is, like you said, take a pill, take a supplement, you know, they're called supplements for a reason. They're supposed to supplement your healthy eating lifestyle. You know, they're not supposed to be in lieu of. And again, you can't under um, value exercise. I mean, exercise is just, and it's got to be daily. You know, you got to move daily. So, um, those two things in concert should help. I mean, you're the expert on that one, but you know, a person should feel pretty significantly better in a matter of weeks if they do both the right movement and right eating. Absolutely. Completely agree with you. Well, I really appreciate your time. I might have to have you back on. This was a really great talk. The time <laughs> flew by and uh, we might have to have more discussions about inflammation because there's just, again, there's so many different routes and, in uh, areas and, and uh, topics that we could discuss and go into more detail, but yeah, we'll just leave it at that for now. Um, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you or if they want, you know, if you want to share a resource with them, um, just feel free to do that right now. Well, I, my website is called DorothyEats.com and uh, that's the best way to get a hold of me. Um, you know, you can email me through my website and I will get it. And I'm happy to talk to you. I'm all, I'm just, you know, email me questions, you know, just, recipe ideas. I mean, anything you want. I'm, I'm happy to, very happy to support people as they, you know, make this transition because you do need help and support because depending on where you live, 
finding the right kinds of foods can be really challenging. So I'm happy to help with that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And my pleasure. Agree, yep, it's all about helping and supporting one another. And thanks for supporting my audience today. Sure. And uh, be safe out there. Yeah, you too. Thanks, okay. Mark. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.